Okay, maybe I can start by by the introductions and then people will still come. So welcome everyone to the uh, AIDA uh, 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 lectures, excellence lectures on AI. So as you know, these are lectures that uh, we have uh, 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 as uh, as frequent as possible, and we invite. Uh, uh, Lectures to to give a, a lecture on 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 some topics related to to AI and uh, all all the lectures are recorded so you can still access to them on the uh, on the website of uh, of Ida we have uh, the previous recordings and this is uh, the same for this one we will have the slides and uh, the recordings after the uh, presentation in a few days on the on the website um, so uh, to uh, before the introduction some. Uh, uh, just uh, very uh, uh, simple principles. Uh, it's much better we we mute uh, all, all of us uh, during the the, the presentation. Uh, during the Q A session, you could ask ever the uh, directly questions, and I would manage the Q A session. Or you could ask on the on the chat. I would also take the questions uh, for for the lecture. Okay, so thank you, all of you. So first, uh, thanks, uh, Marcus. Uh, so Marcus is. Uh, um, uh, is a director of uh, a director of the bio uh, chemical integration department at the Max Planck uh, Institute. Uh, so uh, he uh, we have his bio in the on the website, but you could uh, have a look. That it's really interesting because it's uh, uh, between AI and uh, uh, and let's say biochemistry, chemistry, and uh, ecology also. So that's really interesting, and we are I'm quite also interested personally to see uh, how. We can uh, uh, deal with all these kind of uh, techniques in uh, in these domains. Uh, he has uh, uh, served uh, to 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 several, let's say, uh, institutions, and he's part of the Ellis also, uh, the, the Open Laboratory for Learning and, uh, and Intelligent Systems, which is one of the excellence networks on uh, on AI. Uh, he got several awards, including the uh, ERC Synergy uh, Grant. Um, uh, and uh, please, the floor is to, to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and also for the kind kind introduction. Yes, I will try to talk uh, to you guys who are, I think, uh, mostly um, very strong in artificial intelligence, computer science, while I'm actually a geoscientist. So I will give a talk that's certainly more from the applied point of view uh, and uh, discuss some opportunities that are existing in the, in the geosciences and uh, then also introduce this kind of hybrid modeling uh, concept that we have been thinking about uh, quite a bit, uh, where actually one brings together the main domain knowledge, domain science knowledge, and uh, and the machine learning. Um, yeah, so if you <clears throat> talk about uh, the Earth uh, system, uh, this is kind of, kind of our study object from space. Uh, and it's a very uh, exciting and interesting uh, object because it's a, it's a very complex system where biological, chemical, and physical processes interact uh, with each other, um, forming kind of through these, these interactions uh, a system that is one of the most complex one that we, we are studying overall. Uh, and then there's another um, scientific challenge that is quite interesting. It's, it's the uniqueness of the Earth. So basically, while for organisms also, we can uh, create experiments, uh, put them into different conditions and see how these interventions basically play out. Uh, for the Earth, uh, we are currently doing an experiment that you all know, the, 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 um, the climate warming, the anthropogenic warming, but but we only have one system, so we cannot um, have replicate Earth where we can basically then have um, uh, experiments and, and learn from that. Um, so that means basically we need to learn from uh, observations. Uh, that we take uh, and if you go into the future we have to learn also from our general theoretical understanding that is uh, embedded in, in models. Of course one can do experiments on smaller scales but on the whole, whole earth uh, we only have this one earth so we have no no replicates. On the right hand side a typical geographical uh, if you want bigger a bit showing again the complexity of the earth system in terms of different spatial scales, uh, where, how the Earth is organized from molecular level to the globe, where the ecosystems um, play quite an important uh, 
role and one is kind of spanning 17 orders of magnitude uh, in terms of space uh, there. So this kind of um, uh, system view of the Earth is, is established not more than for 50, 60 years, maybe. So it's pretty young, actually. Um, it has been here coined as intertwined Earth in a, in a, in a Max Planck um, research um, journal. And if we think about now the, the Earth as a system, the first thing is one divides into, into subsystems, and these are the spheres in, in, in the Earth, so the atmosphere that you see on top, and the biosphere, the green one, the, the hydrosphere, the, the water, and particularly the oceans, but also fresh water, uh, and then the cryosphere, uh, which um, determines uh, a lot of what's going on, of course, in, in the glaciers and, and uh, uh, and a role system um now since uh, the second world war which is usually called then the great acceleration uh humans played really a, a whole dominant role in the earth system and uh, this has been also led to the term anthropocene uh, so basically a uh, Geological age, where, where the humans really are, uh, are a geologic uh, force, <clears throat> and we can see that, for example, from space. Also, by, by uh, in the night here, we are looking at the night lights uh, that are emitted from from human activity. So we have these kind of subsystems where where the where the uh, technosphere or the uh, anthroposphere uh, is not part of the of the of of the picture now, uh, and uh, and these subsystems actually interact with each other by exchanging on the one hand matter, so like for example trace gases, CO2, or water that then forms clouds, for example, and on the other hand also energy, long wave and short wave radiation, uh, for example. So this is just a kind of a broad textbook uh, system view, uh, uh, quite simple. But the point is that this kind of um, is really the predominant uh, paradigm uh, when we talk about um, Earth system modeling. And it has been actually put together also in formal modeling approaches uh, like this one where you may not want to read uh, everything, but it basically is a, um, is a diagram of processes on Earth that interact with each other. And, and the idea of this reductionistic Earth system modeling is uh, that all the different sub-processes, uh, for example, here, the physical climate system you see uh, on, on, on top, um, or, or the biogeochemical cycles here on bottom. On the right-hand side, you see the, um, the land. On the left-hand side, the ocean. Um, all the, if, if the idea is basically if, if you are able to model the individual sub processes of the sub sub subsystems uh, and then put everything together one is able to model the emergent behavior of the of the whole system so you see here that's the Bretherton diagram it has been kind of drawn in in the in the 80s uh, of last century um yeah and as i said this is kind of the prevailing has been the prevailing paradigm and of course it has been a quite successful paradigm also in particular for the physical processes climate models are, are based on that and they do make important predictions uh one one example uh, is actually the uh in this context uh, the weather uh, forecast um and basically with this paradigm people have been basically arguing, for example, recently Peter Bauer from Eastern WF, uh, that we can actually now create a digital twin of uh, of the Earth. And so basically with all these equations, physical equations, here in particular the atmosphere, uh, we can create a picture of the Earth that is hard to distinguish from the real world, from the observations at least of the real world. So I guess it will be difficult for you to tell which one of those <clears throat> disks is a remote sensing image and 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 which one of, of those um is um actually just a simulation with uh, such a model that i just introduced uh, before so basically now the computation power allows really high resolution uh, simulations also so that these equations can really can really play out so this is certainly a, a has been certainly a successful paradigm 
But um, and and yeah, so there's just a little excursion also in this paradigm. Um, AI uh, plays an interesting and important role. So if we just think about evolution of the atmosphere for the next seven to ten days, so weather forecast. Um, and yeah, so now I must tell you, unfortunately, I have a new uh, laptop and uh, the uh, the MP4 codec is somehow still not working. So I cannot show you the animation. So we imagine that you have now we have here now an, uh, a movie of of clouds moving over the over the over the globe. Uh, unfortunately, it's not working. Um, I only found it out half an hour before the meeting. But it's also the main point is basically yeah. Uh, so these kind of physical descriptions um are possible and uh, and work but they are actually computationally very very expensive um and so uh, the world has actually seen in the last two years uh, really revolutionary advances from three independent groups uh, how some of those computational challenges can be can be addressed with uh, with machine learning uh, approaches with graph neural networks um, other approaches um, too i won't go into detail but i just want to mention that uh, that actually, the, this is uh, yeah, that's actually one one of the AI revolutions uh, in in this in this field uh, because basically it allows forecasts that are that are orders of magnitude faster than the than the classical weather forecast. Partly it's because of course also GPU speed up, but not only, and uh, and then at the same time these these uh, forecasts that are trained on past um, data are uh, actually. Even more precise uh, than uh, than the, than the physical weather forecast. So this is pretty cool, but I'm not going to talk about it. I will I will talk about uh, another part where AI, AI can probably play uh, an even more, more fundamental impact. Here it's mostly about speed, yeah? but uh, um, okay. So I should quote here Peter Dubin from Ethan. We have really mentioned that after the silent revolution of weather forecast improvements, uh, now we have basically machine learning revolution. A lot of uh, a lot of it's to come also um, more improved uh, and, and faster weather forecast. Um, but um, yeah, so what I want to say is basically, but we have actually some, some issues with this paradigm, with this reductionistic approach. And this is basically seen here on the, uh, on the center. And this is if we, Think about a little bit longer time scales where feedbacks, uh, the Earth system play an important role. Uh, here's just one example: the carbon cycle, which is one of uh, my uh, different of those models that all have these physical equations, in, but in one or the other way, there's some other parameterizations uh, depending on the model, and and, and what we can. See see how much carbon dioxide is taken up by by the land so you may or may not know that uh, currently we are actually roughly one quarter is going to the ocean is absorbed by the ocean by diffusion processes and and the other uh, quarter is absorbed by terrestrial ecosystems by forests that Take up carbon dioxide uh, in photosynthesis and then store it somewhere in the roots or uh, or elsewhere in the soil or in the, in, in the wood. So kind of currently uh, we have this uptake of carbon uh, on the order of, of two petagrams per year, and that's also something that that many models basically show here in uh, in the late uh, 2010s. But then if we go into the future the models really diverge uh, quite strongly uh, up to the point that some actually say the ecosystem will not take up any carbon anymore. So basically, currently we are, uh, the, the ecosystem save us and uh, absorb some of the carbon, so they mitigate the climate change. But uh, some models actually say, oh, it will become negative at some point in the mid, mid, mid of this century. Um, and so it will actually fuel uh, the climate change further. So then we have a positive uh, feedback and, and other models say well no but it will actually uh, uh, the uptake will increase further so this is of course scientifically very um, unsatisfying <clears throat> and obviously this this pure physical paradigm is not uh, working it existed already 2006 in another paper by the same author 
And if you would draw it now, it would look very, very similar. So there has been really um, a crisis in, in Earth system modeling and a crisis with this approach. And that actually has led us a couple of years ago to, to think about what uh, do we need. Um, and, and you come relatively fast to the conclusion that really the integration of, of the large amount of data that is around uh, is really insufficient in these in these modeling approaches so far. Um, well, so this is a very simple figure ma making basically the point that um, actually Earth system data is prototypical for for uh, for big data because it really uh, addresses or uh, um, all the four V's of of, um, of big data, and there is one uh, one V that where I think it's particularly um, uh, yeah, particularly relevant. I mean, that's that's a variety. We have very very diverse um, data sources from time series at individual stations to remote sensing uh, data with satellites which cover the Earth every day. So we have dense fields of observations. We have um, <clears throat> campaign based uh, data that covers only a certain amount of time with, with, with airplanes and and so on and so forth so this is um, certainly a quite a big um, challenge for those people that that do data science and, uh, and and computer science in this in this context it's an opportunity actually so let me let me give you uh, one uh, or two examples uh, from our work. We we basically uh, embrace this variety of data. So on the one end, of course, is heterogeneity always creates headaches. But also, since the different data streams contain different information on different time and space scales, it's also something that we should exploit. And uh, here's one example. It's about um, the carbon cycle. So it's about uh, what ecosystems exchange. With the atmosphere. So I told you just before that 25% of our emissions are currently taken up by ecosystems. That can be also measured with those uh, stations that are that are indicated here. Uh, I won't go into detail how how it's done. But it's you get you know, data sets from half hours to several decades. These measurement systems are deployed in, in it's, uh, indicated here, sorry for the very small fonts, but uh, basically these are kind of, we call them fingerprints, more um, scientific would be to call them uh, isoplete diagrams, where on the x-axis we have time of the day, on the y-axis we have time of the year, and then the colors basically code what the ecosystems are doing in terms of carbon dioxide uptake or release. The greenish, bluish colors are uptake and, and the and the red ones are, are release. And you see, for example, in a tropical forest, we have basically all year round good conditions for uptake during the day. So we see there's a green band here while in the night there's no sun. So then the respiration, the release of carbon dioxide will, will dominate. While for a European beach forest, it looks of course very, very different. Uh, it really starts abruptly to photosynthesize end of April when the leaves get out. Uh, we have very large fluxes. They are the same level as in the tropical rainforest, but the season is shorter uh, and then it ends up pretty abruptly in, in, in autumn again. And because of the shorter season, the overall carbon dioxide uptake is, is less than in the tropical rainforest. And in the Mediterranean forest is again different in principle, you see it can be green all year round, uh, but you see here this strong uh, depression, so no no more dark green areas in, in July and August, and that's actually when the uh, ecosystems suffer from, from drought stress. So that's kind of the Mediterranean drought, everything is shutting down, and the fluxes are really, really uh, 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 lower than the activity of, of vegetation. So this is just to give you an impression. So basically for each point on that, um, on that map that you can also see here again, we get kind of these fingerprints over 10 or 20 years, all kind of weather conditions sampled 
um, and, uh, and and the response uh, uh, sampled basically um, as well. For example, in terms of water flux, but also in, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of carbon flux, but also in terms of water flux. For example, how much water is uh, evaporating from the surface. Um, but if you look at that map, okay, this is uh, still doesn't give us a global picture because these are just individual dots, and the dots are of course too big. Um, a square kilometer is kind of covered by each of these sensors. If you think about, we have thousand stations, let's say, but we have but the land surface is not thousand square kilometers, but one hundred million, uh, more than one hundred million square kilometers. So we are talking about. Um, um, orders of magnitude more area than, than covered. And and also it's not representative, as you see, uh, in, in, in geographical space, so one cannot just average the data and to get a global picture or something like that. And geostatistical approaches will be also difficult because of this uneven sampling. Um, so the idea is basically uh, uh, bring this data set, uh, which is a very unique and specific data set, bring that together with with a variety of other data sets. And, and the variety of other data sets then cover the global scale. So here, basically, we these data sets that I just mentioned cover these kind of local scale up to one square kilometer, but covers temporal scales from a minute to uh, to the de several decades uh, now. And then we have Earth observation data, remote sensing data that, as I mentioned, cover cover the globe fully every couple of days, um, but actually those data streams don't measure directly the CO2 flux, right? I mean, the, the, these just measure the color of the Earth. So it's kind of the interaction uh, um, of the Earth's surface with electromagnetic uh, radiation, um, mostly from, uh, from the sun. Um, and so it's only an indirect measurement, for example, of the greenness of the Earth. So there's not a direct measurement of what the ecosystems are doing, but more in the proxy measurement of some of their states, for example, how many leaves are there. Um, so we need to basically build a model um, that that maps those proxy data, this kind of um, color of, of, the, uh, of, of the Earth, to those fluxes that we, uh, that we are actually really interested in, for example, the carbon fluxes. And this is kind of then here the intersection of those time and space gates where we have joint information in both data streams and uh, and the joint information is just can be just extracted basically with uh, with with machine learning approaches by mapping one uh, stream on the other. I only show here uh, remote sensing data, uh, but of course in the, the second uh, stream that is uh, very helpful here is of course um, remote uh, meteorological observations that are coming from the weather forecasts um, that I mentioned also at the at the beginning. And yeah, so if we have built such a model um, with whatever uh, approach and architecture, then one can basically apply it globally and, and one can get a global picture. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so with this, uh, actually then we, uh, this is already some years ago or uh, 15 years ago or so, Actually, uh, back in 2010, we basically then got uh, actually the really the first observation-based picture of the breathing of the biosphere. Unfortunately, also this animation doesn't work now on my computer, but you see at least a snapshot here in January. We see here a uh, little activity in Europe uh, and, and, and strong activity, for example, here in the, uh, in the tropics and uh, also the southern, uh, southern hemisphere. Uh, so we and we get basically this dynamically updated for each month. Uh, so we get really a picture of what the Earth is doing in terms of carbon dioxide uptake and release. If you want every day uh, of the year. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, and of course we are not doing this to make pretty pictures or so. But but then one can, for example, uh, and we did that. Back in the days, uh, compared, for example, then these estimates, these data-driven estimates, and um, with uh, process models, and you see uh, already from that figure here, which is a latitudinal plot, so basically on x-axis latitude, and then y-axis now the photosynthesis, so carbon uptake by photosynthesis, and you see that the process models here have really large uncertainty, large span, different models say different things, and we can basically constrain with our data-driven approach what the process models should be doing 
course, we also have uncertainties that are indicated, um, but they are much smaller than 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 purely from this from this reduction, reductionistic approach. Um, and actually, it, this interaction then with the process more or less actually led uh, them to think about some process, how light penetrates the canopy, what the nitrogen cycle, how it matters for, for, for the carbon fluxes, and it actually helped uh, them to improve um, their models already. Uh, another more more practical uh, conclusion that we can actually take from those kind of data driven diagnosis of the carbon cycle uh, is is here on the right hand side because we can basically ask the question um, which what is the efficiency with which the plants with their photosynthesis convert radiation energy into into chemical energy um, and you can basically see that here. Um, it's really well below this zero, uh, well below one one percent uh, of of, um, of of efficiency, um, and and these this, the highest efficiencies are only reached when actually the precipitation levels are high enough. When the precipitation is low, uh, then plants are actually not doing well. Um, if there's if it's dry and deserts, for example. Uh, and then uh, these efficiencies are not reached even at all. So, um, and if you compare that to, um, for example, photovoltaics, I put here an uh, efficiency line of 10%. That's this very steep line. Uh, and photovoltaics is really now um, on, on the left hand side, um, really indicating that it's probably not a good idea to bet on bioenergy to solve our energy crisis um, because they are just more efficient approaches and also approaches that do not um, consume water. Um, yes, so the second, uh, um, second uh, example, but I see I'm a bit slow, um, is of course, so the first example was more like regression approaches or trying to predict uh, quantities. The second one is more on, on the detection of anomalies. And, and that basically exploits, again, the fact that we have so many data streams Again, an animation here, but you see basically different Earths with different variables here. And the question is basically, can we detect uh, early on that something is abnormal in these multivariate um, data streams? So basically, anomaly detection is a big topic in, in, in this Earth system. Science, extreme events play an important role. Um, and yeah, again... <laughs> Animation is missing, but basically, yes, we can basically do that uh, with respective uh, approaches. Um, and here we have, for example, a data kind of a cube of 2010. Uh, Europe uh, is here kind of in, in this cube. And you see basically in, in August, January, August 2010, we have basically det detected here this big uh, event in space and time that was pretty uh, abnormal. Um, this was then the Russian heat wave, but the main point is um, that, yeah, indeed, we can basically automatically detect that from the different data streams. And if we now look at that globally, we actually see that uh, that now abnormal situations in the atmosphere not always lead to negative extremes in the uh, in, in the biosphere. So that's basically shown how the biosphere is affected by these multivariate uh, extreme events in the in, in the atmosphere and you see a couple of red dots a lot of red dots of course so these are the negative effects but we see also blue dots uh, so then actually we had a positive effect of, a, of, a, of an extreme of a climate extreme and the question is of course then okay what is the cause uh, or, or what is what is the reason under which conditions are these extreme events really detrimental and under which conditions are they neutral or, or even positive uh, then one can make uh, look at this in this kind of plot, no, just a divariate uh, plot. Temperature and soil moisture, we hypothesize, play a role. It also shows off a bit um, at low soil moisture and relatively high temperatures. We have more red dots, but it's not really fully um, discriminatory, basically. And then, so of course, then one can uh, try to explain those deviations with uh, with machine learning and. Um, uh, explainable machine learning plays an important role here. And what we actually see saw here that actually the land cover, the vegetation itself played an important role. Forests seem to be actually more resilient and respond positively, but then also uh, the duration, for example, um, 
if you have a longer duration of an extreme event, uh, this is usually more detrimental. Uh, or soil moisture, if you have enough soil moisture, then it's actually more, uh, has a more positive effect uh, compared to, to less soil moisture. So this is just one, one very quick example. Um, yeah, so then let me quickly go. I mean, this was actually all uh, classical machine learning approaches. Uh, and of course, in the Earth system, deep learning uh, can play a very important role because we have uh, to do. And so we have always a kind of context. Um, both in space and time, which makes uh, deep learning approaches, of course, very um, uh, able um, to 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 work with such data. In uh, back in, this, in that paper, we basically um, identified a, a couple of really like Earth system tasks that are really really analogous to um, to classical machine learning tasks, like object classification, classical image net things, uh, uh, um, boil down to pattern classification in these kind of Earth images where one can detect atmospheric rivers or, or hurricanes um, and, and so on and so forth. Or super resolution can be maybe more interestingly applied for statistical downscaling of climate and weather forecasts. And if we go into the more temporal domain, video prediction directly mapped into short term forecasting of dynamic variables over the Earth. Um, or if you think about language um, translation, there we often have the case that the meaning of a word depends really on what has been said a couple of sentences before, which is very similar to time series modeling in, in the Earth um, system. For example, how a certain ecosystem responds depends, for example, if the forest has been cut 20 years ago uh, or not, and these kind of things. So the kind of these kind of past context plays also quite an important role in the Earth system. So that's that's basically I think almost just I just wanted to. <laughs> Make this point again. Or I think it's pretty evident. For um, uh, meanwhile, um, we um, I would quickly give you one one example of our research, which we found really uh, exciting, and uh, still working on, on it uh, on on some things. And the, basically, the question is if we can predict um, weather impacts or climate impacts on 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 a landscape scale. And um, basically, the idea is. Um, from geography is basically that we have climate, human geofactors, and they basically shape landscapes. But there is no real physical model that can account for all the different uh, interactions between these factors and highly localized effects and so on. So there's no model that predicts the landscape based on, on those factors. So we basically thought, okay, uh, but on the other hand, it's clear that on the landscape scale, uh, one pixel or one, one, one neighborhood influences the other one. For example, if you have a mountain or so, things will percolate down and, and these kind of things. So we were basically wondering if given now these factors, these drivers like temperature, precipitation, and, and so on and so forth, can we actually predict how an image would of the of the landscape would look like from, from space? And that in this work we basically used a conditional uh, GAN. Um, and uh, and in fact, actually, it worked uh, very, very well. Um, so yeah, it's hard to distinguish um, which is a prediction and which is the, <laughs> the test data. Yeah, so the upper one is a predicted one, the lower one, the observed. Uh, and, and you see that basically these different landscapes, including their spatial characteristics and their, uh, the, the, the spatial context basically is uh, pretty nicely, not perfectly, but but nicely actually um, predicted just from those climate uh, climate drivers. Uh, and of course, then that was just visual and it was also a bit cherry picked, but then one can, of course, and should uh, do metrics and see how good these kind of spatial metrics, like fractal dimension of the landscape or connectance of, of patches, uh, how good is that represented? And uh, and here the upper uh, line is always the um, the gun, which could use spatial context while fully connected network or or handicapped gun, where actually the spatial pixels were kind of shuffled, so that no spatial connections could be discovered. Are, are really much 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 worse. Uh, so so it seems to be uh, actually plausibly uh, working um, quite um, quite well. And of course, then it's tempting to use those models also for predictions. For example, uh, 
saying, okay, it's, this is uh, how, how a pixel or how a landscape looks li like now and what happens now given the model uh, if you change temperature and annual pre uh, precipitation. And it does make actually plausible uh, predictions, which could be helpful for communication of, of climate impacts over landscapes. Uh, but of course, we have to be very careful because this is, of course, exactly a statistical extrapolation and there can be shortcut learning uh, involved, uh, confining factors. Uh, so it's not a causal model. Uh, so one has to be, of course, very, very careful. <clears throat> uh, yeah, okay. Here's actually the model actually learns space variability and then one would basically use space for time, which is very often done in ecology. And it's then done in a very sophisticated way with a deep learning model. But um, careful, one has still to be uh, very clear. Um, and but of course we have uh, we do have uh, temporal data, um, a lot of temporal data. Um, for example, here let's see. You now this will also not yeah, this will also not play. But it's actually a nice animation from the ESA and from 2018 where we could see basically within a month in real time how the landscape, the or the continent, the here north and in uh, Western Europe and or uh, in Central Europe, uh, basically could brown from uh, from green to brown uh, uh, within a month through the through the heat wave and drought uh, in 2018. Uh, but then, if you look actually locally, um, there can be actually quite some different differential uh, effect if we really zoom in. This is now here around around Jena. Uh, and if you even look at drone photos and then you see also here some some very localized effects. And the question is, can we predict effects of extreme events uh, in this kind of localized fashion? Things might depend on if you're on a north facing slope or on a south facing slope, if you're close to groundwater or not. And these are all, all landscape features, again, where um, uh, um, one can hand design these features, distance from a river or something like that, no? And, but uh, again, of course, the, the offer, uh, the thing that deep learning offers is to, um, to uh, not uh, need to design these uh, features, but rather extract with uh, convolutions and so on the, the features out of the, 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 raw uh, the raw data. And uh, it's, that's why we believe it's actually will be possible or is possible to predict um, the um, evolution of a landscape over a seasons or over several seasons responding to, for example, a drought. And that's, of course, then quite, uh, quite important if one is able to predict where there will be problems with croplands or problems with, uh, with forests. Um, yes. So this is kind of the EarthNet um, data set and challenge that we have been putting up. Uh, also, we have been working on that. Um, quite promising results uh, so that there is predictability in the system um, um, on, on that local level. But um, I don't want to go deeper into this. Uh, I've been losing already too much time. I want to make, of course, one important point that these are all approaches that are really purely data-driven. So they are really the opposite of, of this reductionistic approach, uh, statistical method at the end. Uh, so should one really throw away all the knowledge that, that one uh, that one has? And of course not. Um, this is actually one of the founding principles um, of our uh, of our of our Alice unit also in in, in Jena, uh, where we really think we need to integrate knowledge and and machine learning in in, in this context. And um, you see here the matrix. So knowledge integration can be of course done in different ways. So already if you do a space state space modeling or spatial temporal modeling, you introduce some inductive bias and some knowledge. Causal modeling is, of course, a very important facet uh, um, here. Uh, and then the, the hybrid modeling is a, a thing that I would like to um, introduce uh, with, with one or two examples very quickly, um, because we think that this can be quite, quite useful in, in this context uh, in particular. So what is this hybrid modeling? I come again more from the system modeling perspective now. So here, this is kind of a sketch of a system model with a submodel one, submodel two. The submodel one is forced by something, external forcing. It gives some output, and this output is an input to submodel two. And this output uh, can then feed into other submodules, or it can also feed back to sub submodule one. And um, I, I won't go now into all uh, possibilities where machine learning can actually help with the system modeling, but I, I, in the interest of time, oops, in the interest of time, I will directly go to this hybrid modeling. The idea is basically if you have 
uh, as for example, the submodel one, we have this model is anyway not very well defined theoretically or so, but maybe with some ad hoc parametrization and so on, then why not replace such a submodel of the full model with a machine learning based model? And uh, uh, why the submodel two is still fully um, fully physically um, based. So that's basically the idea. Here's, here's a simple example. If we think about this flux of water from ecosystem to the atmosphere, this is the diffusion flux, of course. Uh, but the diffusion is controlled by those guys that you see on the bottom, the stomata in the leaves that can open and close, so like wells that open and close. And this is not so easy to be described from first principles as, as diffusion. Uh, so the idea is basically to say, well, yes, you have the governing equation, the diffusion equation that you see on, 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 on the top. Um, but, um, but then we have this diffusion coefficient that is controlled by the stomata. By these stomata, um, by these valves, and the, the, and so we basically say, well, the D, the diffusion coefficient, we basically model with a machine learning approach. Um, so we have kind of this kind of hybrid approach. There's a governing equation, but part of the equation is uh, it's machine learned, and uh, and uh, so this would be then in this case because it's in simple uh, ODE, then it would be then also go, people would also call it new um, ODE. Meanwhile. Um, and maybe I don't know if I need to give this example, but one this has been also coined uh, semi-parametric modeling in the 80s already, uh, very good work there. And so one can actually, to explain it, one can start with a very simple case, a linear regression. You see here just a linear regression, and this is basically how radiation on the x-axis influences photosynthesis. So I assume that this is kind of linear, you see it on the left-hand side. On the right hand side, the scatter plot already doesn't look so well because the slope, the A, uh, depends in this case on a, on a different variable. TA is air temperature. And um, we can color the points with air temperature, and you will see already ah, with cold temperatures it's lower, and with higher temperatures it's, it's, it's higher. So, how would one as an ecologist classically look at that? One would make a, if you want a non parametric model, you would divided into some arbitrary classes of temperatures, and then you calculate the slopes for, the, for the different classes, and then you get out the different slopes. But this is a little bit arbitrary where, where you put the, the classes. So the idea of the hybrid modeling is basically that we um, say, well, we have this equation, it's linear equation, but we predict the coefficient A um, with some neural network, for example, as a function of air temperature or, or other variables. And so by that, we get a prediction of the target variable that we have observed, but also of the slope, which in this sense then is a latent a variable that, that is unobserved. And uh, if we do it, <clears throat> actually, yes, we basically then get uh, again this nice scatter plot between the modeled photosynthesis and the observed one. And uh, on the right hand side, we get an inference of this slope parameter, which is the radiation use efficiency in our domain science uh, words. And, and then we get actually here this kind of optimum curve. And you have to believe me. That's of course that's a synthetic experiment. That's basically what we got, um, what we put also in, uh, with some noise and so on. So it, it actually this approach um, is, is working quite nicely in these simple settings, um, and it can then be uh, used to make predictions, but also to infer something about the system. Let me skip this uh, because I'm really a bit out of out of time. Um, because I just want to give you the last perspective, which is now applying such a hybrid approach in a little bit more real world <clears throat> example, a bit more complex uh, example, but it's basically the same uh, principle. So here we have a global hydrological model, which is very, very simple. If you look at the bottom, it is really just a set of mass balance equations, which make sure that mass balance, mass conservation is, is obeyed. Uh, I give you just an example here. GW is a groundwater, so groundwater is a state variable that is uh, um, where QB is a base flow. It's subtracted, so flow out of the groundwater is subtracted. Then we have recharge here that is added um, to the to the groundwater, and another overflow, so fast flow of water from from the top is also added to update the groundwater next state. Uh, and then similar for this cumulative water deficit, which is kind of soil moisture. And so we have these equations that really govern the system, uh, which make sure everything is kind of behaving 
well, we don't have negative water uh, and so on. And um, but, but of course, then there are parts of the equations, so for example, how the precipitation that falls on the ground is uh, distributed between different processes like fast flow uh, runoff. So how much is going away? How much is recharging soil moisture? And the third one, how much of it is recharging groundwater? And this is not so easy to derive from, from, from physical principles. It depends on a lot of complexity and vegetation and so on. So the idea is basically these coefficients, uh, how much is now um, going in, in each of the paths, we learn uh, basically with a, with a machine learning approach. Um, in this case, we use the recurrent new network, LSTM, with some feature extraction from also spatial fields. Not Don't go into detail. The main point is that we have, again, this dichotomy of a skeleton of equations mass balance equations here, and then coefficients that are that are learned with a, in this case, a you know, recurrent, um, yeah, and out encoder architecture. Um, so basically these kind of these two, uh, these two uh, approaches linked together. Uh, and then you, what we can see here also, we can see the dark orange um, variables, snow water equivalent, evapotranspiration, terrestrial water storage uh, and, and the runoff um, that, that are all observed variables um, so they can be used in a multi-task uh, uh, cost function basically to, to constrain the system. Uh, but then we also have these other variables where we don't have uh, observation. So for example, the groundwater are very hard to observe globally or the soil moisture. And, and these are then variables that fall out of the system as latent variables and hypothesized uh, variables. Uh, and in fact, again, I need to gloss over that. It actually works quite well on all the variables. Uh, it actually is at par and even better than that. Than very complex <laughs> physical models. So the kind of the neural network can actually uh, uh, embed um, the uh, the dynamics quite um, quite well. On these coefficients, yeah, here would be another nice animation. On, on, on water cycle components, uh, the upper ones are the ones that are actually observed, but then on the bottom you would see groundwater storage and soil water deficit, and uh, you would see how that changes over over, <laughs> over space and time. Uh, very clearly, clear wave patterns that make a lot of sense. So while we don't have a proof that the latent inference works, it at least is plausible, and we need to compare that to other data sets and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, that also doesn't work. Uh, and I only give you one last um, okay video. One one last nice uh, take home that we uh, also took from that actually the model was smarter than we thought because we were looking basically here into uh, the question of evaporative fraction. So how much water is evaporating compared to the available energy against soil water deficit? And we expected well if the soil is dry, high soil water deficit, there should be very little evaporative fraction. This is also what we see in the purple line here for most of the data points. But when we saw the whole plot at the beginning, what the model predicts, uh, we were quite surprised that it was not this thin line, but there were some of these other dots that are now yellow. But when we plotted them first, we didn't plot them with colors. So we were wondering, what is the model going or doing? Uh, there's evaporation when the soil is super dry. That's not possible. But then uh, we had the idea to look into um, time since precipitation significant precipitation and voila what we see is yes these are these yellow dots and then some of the green ones are actually the ones when that had rain before so the soil is still very very dry but there has been maybe a little bit of rain like one millimeter two millimeters and this is then evaporated from the surface so the model although we didn't have several soil layers also learned that there are layers and uh, encoded those in the in the state in this case of the um, of the LSTM uh, so it really learned some of the dynamics uh, without us putting them in at all. So that we were very happy about that. So last uh, slide, it was a bit of wrap up. I really want to make the point here uh, that, that we should not replace all the process-based modeling uh, with, uh, with data-driven science, but we should see that this classical approach with hypothesis, model building, and so on should be complemented with a more data-driven and observation-driven approach, where one gets to observation-driven products, one recognizes observed patterns. These patterns can generate hypotheses that explain those patterns. 
And at the end, it needs to be a circle where then these hypotheses are, um, are basically tested in a, in a model. And then it's really getting interested if we compare the observed patterns uh, to something, to, to a model and see basically if the emergent properties from the model, the predicted patterns basically are similar to the observed patterns or not. And only if they are, um, if they are not similar, then then we have actually a surprise and we have an interesting puzzle and it, and we cannot always just say oh the observed patterns are are a surprise that some people some some empirical people sometimes will say ah oh, this is really surprising but they didn't formulate actually what kind of model mind model they had uh, and and often some observed patterns are kind of counterintuitive for our our thinking but uh, but they're actually not a big surprise if we have a proper model that can basically um, uh, derive those emergent uh, those those emergent properties, um, um, and and so in some cases can be also that the apparently surprising observed patterns are actually not so surprising because the models actually do model those. And then in other cases, it's not the case, and then we um, need to continue with model improvement, which is actually the scientific work that we all <clears throat> are all doing. Yeah, thanks for your attention. Uh, Somehow I took more time than I wanted, um, but I hope it was uh, insightful. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was very uh, inspiring also, uh, giving a lot of, uh, <laughs> let's say, details on uh, on how it works and how we can combine this, uh, these domains. Um, uh, guys, if you have questions, uh, you can raise your hand or ask on the on the chat as you, as you want. Any question? Yeah, I, I may have one, one, one regarding the, um, uh, I'm not expert at all on, on the stuff, but for the, for the habit side, um, uh, is it, um, uh, uh, you explained very well how the deep learning approaches could, uh, could work on, uh, on, on these models, but do you, uh, on these approaches, but um, how you see the things? Is it still uh, how would be the I mean the the, the new models uh, in in the future? Like uh, the hybrid is more here to help to discover new things, and then we we will be back to classical models uh, in some way because we will then be able to do things. Or still there are phenomena that uh, with the traditional approaches we will not be able at all to to model them. I don't see, I don't know if you see my point. My point is more, if it's models, the hybrid approach is more an investigation approach, or are we there really models at yet? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good, uh, that's actually oh. a good point. So basically, yeah, so if you think about the hybrid modeling, um, yeah, so I, I I I skipped over that one slide. Um, so of course it has the advantage that also the let's say the end-to-end -end model uh, can be expected to be more um, more robust and also more interpretable. Um, but let's say let's start with robustness. So basically, because in this approach, if you have a deep learning model and at the end it puts out some physical parameters. And then these the physical parameters are put into the model. Uh, this makes sure that the model overall behaves physically. So we believe that you have at least a little bit better extrapolation uh, capacity. Um, but still, of course, within this within this sub module, it's 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 a it's a, it's a statistical approach, and uh, one has to be also uh, careful uh, with extrapolation there. So it, it's a good question if one can. Really, just use it for, uh, for example, for for predictions into, into uh, let's say <clears throat> into into an extrapolation space. Um, so that actually, uh, but it was the initial idea, and um, and then actually this, but then actually we we more and more find that uh, maybe the more interesting thing is actually this um, using this for scientific progress for inferring. Uh, these latent variables that that are not observed and and build hypotheses about those. So understand, trying to understand the system better, 
And then it's probably if we if that can help to understand the system better and we can build through that also better theory, <laughs> then it's probably still better to put in um to put in the new theory that that we have learned into into the model. So I think everything that we know very well we should put into uh, we we don't need to machine learn maybe but those mm. things that we don't know we should uh, we should then let the data speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's that's a good point. I mean, not easy. Um, yeah, not easy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any question? Any other question? No. Shem, you can you can ask also on the on the chat, and, and then I can put them if you want. <laughs> um. Uh. See, um. An, an, another point that is uh, regarding the um. The the uh, simulations and uh, because uh, uh, this could have a lo uh, lot of potential also in simulations and uh, but uh, in terms of uh, simulating very complex phenomena, uh, but um, uh, is it really uh, let's say uh, uh, I mean uh, I assume that the, uh, the 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 dynamics of that is complex but also the timing so I don't know. To uh, I think one of the, the 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 stuff that is difficult is also to be able to predict how things will change in uh, maybe in, uh, in not in, in seconds in your case probably but more in days or months or something like that. Is it something that is uh, investigated in domain like uh, being able to simulate um, and being able yes. to be also. Uh, let's say reliable in terms of uh, simulation because uh, if it is unstable, maybe a few things could change now and then we have several models. Like uh, uh, I have been discussing with some guys in my in, in my in my lab here, they are doing similar things of what you do with uh, with people in in uh, uh, in environment. And uh, one thing is that uh, we are all impressed by the results that uh, we can obtain in terms of simulation. But one point is, is it stable? Because as you said, it's a statistical model and the things are changing. Yeah. So maybe we need also to update the models at one point. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, and uh, so, uh, and basically, the question of time scale and uh, mm. at which time scales uh, the model is valid is uh, very uh, important. I think that is also where then the domain science again comes into play. So, for example, uh, we, if you talk about the atmosphere, uh, I mean, there is, uh, I think, you know, or I feared about uh, the butterfly effect and uh, basically that mm. the, the atmosphere is uh, chaotic and doesn't have a memory uh, uh precise memory of the initial conditions basically beyond uh, seven or, or or ten days mm -hmm. uh and and so so, so there's basically no that that there's a principal uh, limit to predictability um but then it's actually interesting that other parts of the system for example the land um with the soil moisture but also the vegetation phenology um has um has longer uh, time scales of memory, um, so there's actually some uh, some predictability uh, or predictability can be improved by by including uh, soil moisture, for example, in, in the initial conditions, and and um, so some of the statistics will be different in two weeks or or four weeks, depending on if it was dry or not dry in, in in the soil, for example. So these kind of things are uh, are quite important. Um, to note, and then uh, and there we have a lot of data, so we can basically train models, uh, do do cross validation, and so on and so forth, and can understand the, what we can actually predict. Uh, but then we have another time scale, and this is really the time climate time scale, hundred okay. year prediction or something, which of course yeah. everyone is also interested in. That's of course uh, then even uh, more difficult because we don't have really data to train that very well. Of course, there's paleo data, so data from the past, but this data is also pretty sparse. Uh, so then we then then it's becoming really, really challenging to uh, address this extrapolation problem. And there, then we are again coming back, that it's not only about a mere prediction, but we also need to have a better understanding. And so the mechanistic models, the process-based models 
should be improved. For example, based on this hyper approach that I tried to um, explain a bit. Great, great, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments, guys? No. Maybe last point that uh, I'm quite interested. Uh, maybe you know we don't, but in either we are quite interested that uh, this is a. Uh, we discussed at the reopen level with a lot of uh, 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 excellence networks on AI. And uh, something that we are quite interested in and this challenging is how to build, uh, let's say, PhD AI programs and, uh, and even uh, master programs on AI. Um, and I know that your background is, uh, as you said, it's not, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. This is really interdisciplinary. Uh, so do you have any kind of recommendations for people who want to, uh, because I think you moved to AI, or you included AI, I don't know how we can really say uh, how you, you, uh, you uh, uh, but if you have to build something, or maybe you already did that, uh, because I saw your lecture is machine learning for, for basically for, for, for F science. So how you did that and uh, how you see that, uh, any kind of recommendations you have? Yeah, um, of course, we're also um, in Jena um, dealing with that uh, question, of course, in particular, the computer science uh -huh. people. So I think it is, um, it is, of course, uh, I would argue, and we work a lot with PhD um, students who are, who are computer uh, scientists no? uh, now, also since a couple of years, uh, for sure. And and it's of course very important to have the the, the solid um, background in in the field. Um, and at the same time, if they want to uh, be, let's say, I mean, you can of course do very good theoretical work. Uh, that's good. But if you want to to be successful in uh, in a let's say more applied approach uh, or AI for science, uh, then it's of course important to have. Um, the possibility during the studies to to learn something about the the domain science. So it would be I, I would basically recommend uh, to have a, a um, how do you call it a facultative uh, subject on on some domain they can check medicine okay. or environmental science mm -hmm. to have one domain and then maybe they they find it interesting to, in the master thesis also um, to ha to do. Um, the um or to perform the AI developed methods in the context in, inspired by, by by certain certain applications and and uh, and they will also understand that it's important to be able to talk to each other right uh, that the domain uh -huh. scientists can talk to the machine learning people and uh, and, and vice versa I think that's that's really important and um, that's mostly also what um I'm. <laughs> Uh, trying to do so, I'm really not. I'm not. I have no. I cannot. I cannot write a theoretical paper on machine learning because it's not my not really my background. But on an abstract level, uh, it's quite fruitful to discuss with the computer scientists, mm. and they explain me what they can do, what they can model. I explain basically what 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 are the important features that we need, uh, and then one uh, makes progress together. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I think we are, we are over time now and people are still moving. So thank you again for the presentation and the discussion that was really uh, relevant for for Aida and uh, and I hope also for the for I'm sure also for the for the attendance. Uh, thank you for that and uh, all the presentation again will be the presentation and the video will be uh, published soon on the Aida. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.